Welcome. Welcome to this um, uh, Gecko meeting that's hosted by the Gastro Foundation uh, in, a, in association with Project Echo New Mexico. Um, as you know, this meeting is held every every Wednesday. Specifically, this HEC meeting is held once once a month. Um, there are 97 registrations for this meeting from uh, 12, 12 different uh, countries in Africa. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, here we go. Um, So um, we're going to focus on um, the palliative management of patients with um, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, the, the, we, we go, we've invited uh, Rene Krauser and um, Onasai Chinyaka to, to speak. Uh, Dr. Riddick, who was going to talk, unfortunately has COVID and is a little bit unwell. Um, so I'm going to, instead of her talk, we're going to just have uh, our presenter case um, after, after Onasai's um, uh, uh, talk. So just a brief in introduction. And you, uh, a lot of us will, are, or a lot of will be familiar with this uh, Barcelona liver clinic uh, staging system. And we tend to focus on, on, on the early stages of disease and the very early stages of disease where, where patients can potentially be offered one of the three curative um, treat treatment options. Um, and and one of our goals is is to try and start screening programs and 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 to take more patients with with earlier stage disease that is treatable. But the reality that that we are faced with in in large parts of the world in sub-Saharan Africa and in large parts of Asia is that that by far the majority of patients present with either advanced stage or or terminal stage disease. And those are the patients that we see most commonly, and 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 for 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 the most of those patients, um, palliative care is probably the most useful thing that 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 we can offer them. I've included the intermediate intermediate stage here because those patients, although it's a very broad group of patients, are offered taste, which is also not a curative treatment, and ultimately. Um, those patients are, are going to probably die from, from the disease and, and require palliative care. There are some factors that I think make HCC um, a little bit unusual um, when it comes to palliative care. Uh, the patients are often young, especially um, patients who have hepatitis B as the underlying cause for the HCC. Um, the symptom burden of these patients is often very high with common symptoms being pain, uh, fatigue, anorexia, cachexia, ascites, and jaundice and pruritus. Um, a lot of these patients do have associated liver disease. And for some of these patients, um, if you go back to the previous uh, table, you can see at the bottom there, the, the survival time is quite short. So, so the advanced stage, you're looking at an overall survival of 11 months, and in the terminal stage, overall survival, survival is often less than three months. Um, so I'm not going to go into what palliative care is, and, and I think there's other people who can do that much better than me, but I've been looking at different, different definitions, and I think this was one that I thought was quite good. It's a relief from symptoms um, and the stress of a serious illness. And I think one of the reasons why I think that's important is we associate palliative care only with end-of-life care, and I think there's more, more to it than, than that. Um, goals may differ uh, from patient to patient, and I think that's important. And, and also goals for a particular patient um, may, may change over the course of the disease. You know, early on, they just need to come to terms with diagnosis, may not have many symptoms, and la later on as symptoms develop, the disease progresses, um, the, the goals change. Palliative care really does need to be incorporated into the standard of care of all patients that are diagnosed with advanced cancer. And one of the challenges I think we face is, is trying to get the, the timing of the palliative care referral um, right. So that's that's all I have to say now. Um, I do have a case presentation that I will present at the end. And, and it, it um, I think raises some issues about the, the timing of when, when you should get palliative care 
involved. So I'm going to stop sharing. And um, and then Renee Krauser, who's who's one of our palliative care physicians at Hurusker, um, is 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 now going to chat, talk. Thanks, Renee. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to really talk to you about palliative care and really looking at the integration of palliative care for hepatocellular carcinoma. And I really want to thank the HPB team at Hurtiski for really participating and integrating palliative care in daily care in the all patients with HPB. So thank you very much with cancers. So as Mark stated, palliative care, we've got a quite a universal description or this of what palliative care is. And palliative care is about living well. It's about making sure that patients have good quality of life until the end. And some of the fundamental principles are definitely always to include the family and also looking at the prevention of suffering. And as doctors, we know what might lie ahead for a patient. And it's fundamental that we actually look at what might lie ahead and putting things in place for families and patients to prevent the suffering that might lie ahead for patients. Palliative care is looking at the bio, the psychosocial and the spiritual aspects of care. And the definition of palliative care goes on. And it's very fundamental that we know that palliative care definitely is not about euthanasia. It's also not about hastening death, but understanding that death is a normal process and that team involvement and family involvement are core to the care of all patients with life-threatening illnesses. So we know from studies done in lung cancer patients that patients who have received palliative care have less anxiety, have better quality of life and also live longer because of these aspects being addressed in their care. We also know that palliative care is cost-effective care and is not going to break the bank when it's integrated in care. So what about hepatocellular carcinoma? And there's really been quite a lot written about palliative care for these patients and how to integrate palliative care and for this very specific cancer. But in Africa, we face a very specific um, aspects of care that we need to think about when we are looking after these patients. As Mark clearly stated, these patients unfortunately present very late. They have a very poor and very short prognosis. They have a huge burden of symptoms and many times it's easy to concentrate on the pain, but we also know that the patients have cachexia, depression, anxiety, and wonder what might lie ahead for them in the future. We are dealing with liver failure and we have to be very cautious about prescribing to these patients and what we prescribe and the dosages so we ensure that we are not doing further harm. But hepatocellular carcinoma has a huge social, social component. And many times there are huge financial issues, especially when we are dealing with younger patients. And in the Cape Town scenario, where we are looking at patients coming from other countries, we are dealing with refugees, patients who are displaced from their families, making the care much more complex. There is also unfortunately a stigma that is associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. The abuse of alcohol, hepatitis, and all these factors that we need to think about when we are dealing with patients and the impact it had on the family and the family dynamics and actually how future care looks for these patients. Unfortunately, we also have limited access to palliative care, and there's still a huge amount of stigma also around palliative care and the misconception that it's only for end of life care and limited education of palliative care integrated in other disciplines. So when we are looking at these patients, we have to understand that we can't just address the physical. We have to include the psychosocial and the the spiritual aspects of care, because these patients don't only present with physical pain, they present with total pain, 
And as the slide showed, you can't just throw opioids at total pain. You have to address the whole patient as a whole. We've learned a lot also from integrating palliative care in other um, cancers, and we have clear indicated tools that we can use when to integrate palliative care. And I think what stands out, and this is a document that we developed from wood, drawing from the SPIC tool in Edinburgh and working with people here in Cape Town and in South Africa, that we know when we are dealing with cancers that are not amenable to curative care, palliative care needs to be integrated as soon as possible. So we don't want patients to receive palliative care right at the end. When we see now they are deteriorating very fast, we need to actually start the palliative care in long, a long time ahead, especially in patients with hepatocellular carcinoma that we might know that the prognosis might be very short and there's quite a lot to do. So the literature talks about when integrating palliative care, we've got to look at a longitudinal integration of palliative care. And I think this slide illustrates it very nicely what, how palliative care needs to be integrated and that we don't want to integrate palliative care when we have a saying, there's nothing further we can do for you. We need to start much earlier. And the literature shows us how to integrate palliative care starting at all the stages of the Barcelona Clinical Liver Scale, talking about stage one, what needs to be done, stage two, what needs to be done. And very important right at the bottom is the communication that these patients need to receive and the care planning that we need to do from the beginning. We don't want patients to be actually start palliative care right at the end. And that doesn't mean from the beginning, I refer a patient to a hospice. It means the doctors themselves have the knowledge to start with the advanced care planning, have the knowledge to start talking about the difficult conversations that might lie ahead for these patients and families. And of course, very important, the symptom control is initiated at a very early stage. So let's look at these symptoms, and they are complex symptoms that we are dealing with. As said before, pain is number one. It's probably the symptom that we easily work with, that we know what to do. But it's the other signs of, and symptoms that really bother patients, the cachexia, the immobility, the loss of um, the drowsiness, the shortness of breath. All of these aspects of care need to be addressed and very important in these patients, we need to be very proactive managing their constipation. We need to do advanced care planning with these patients, following routes and, and very evidence-based conversations that we can deliver to patients and their families to look at what we want to do with them and hearing their voice in what care they want to receive the psychosocial support, and of course, as stated, it's the care coordination. What care will this patient receive? And as I said, it's especially when we are dealing with patients who come from far away, whose families are in different provinces, in different countries, that we need to think about what are the cultural aspects and what are the aspects that we need to think about where these patients want to be cared for, where these patients want to pass away. And we really need to address these difficult, difficult things far and in advance for these patients. Now, the African Palliative Care Association is an organization that is in Africa. It's an active organization situated in Uganda, working across the whole of Africa, and they have really developed the essential palliative care packages that is doable, it's feasible, it's acceptable within the African context. And if you, I really would encourage you wherever you are working in Africa, that you access this document and access the African Palliative Care Association to guide you on, on, on how to integrate palliative care. But this association and the rest of the world in palliative care knows there are a few fundamental things that we need to do to ensure patients actually receive palliative care. So the first thing 
is we need to ensure there is access to essential medication. And probably the, the most important medication is immediate release morphine that should be available in all countries in Africa. And access means not only that the medication is available in the pharmacy, it means the doctors are able to prescribe it, the doctors know how to adjust dosages, and the patient can actually receive those medication when they go to the primary healthcare setting. And I really want to encourage you in all your settings to actually go and look, do you have immediate release morphine available in your clinics and in your hospitals? The next and important aspect that we do need to know is when we integrate palliative care is palliative care education. There are many, um, there are actually only two universities where you can receive palliative care education in Africa, but there are many short courses that are available and I want to encourage um, if you are working in any area in Africa, make sure your teams actually undergo some palliative care training to understand the basic concepts, what can be do done for patients, how we must prescribe, what symptom management can we provide for these patients, and who the people are and the networks that are available in countries to provide palliative care. The other very important aspect of looking at how we're integrating palliative care is working within a team. And a team is working with your surgeons, working with your oncologists, working also with your social workers and integrating their care from an early stage. And I am very fortunate I work with two trained palliative care nurses, trained palliative care social workers, and we also have our educational program, so we have registrars that join us to undergo their palliative care training. So what have we learned a little bit and just a little bit of what we've learned from starting to integrate palliative care. And I want to talk about what we've learned from integrating palliative care for pancreatic cancer patients from an early stage or from as soon as possible. Firstly, if you are working with teams, make sure that you have consensus on the kind of care, that it's not a, what you do and what I do, but that we sing the same song and we decide this is what we're going to do and we're all going to do it together. There needs to be standardized palliative care in the patients. So the standards of care we need to agree on before the time and what is achievable and feasible in that setting. Whatever you do, you've got to monitor and evaluate what you are doing. And from monitoring and evaluating from our pancreatic cancer patients, we can see that the F16 or the HBB firm are now the biggest palliative care referrals in critical care hospital because we've started a quality improvement tool. Training of oncologists, making sure that the, the palliative care providers are on the ground. And if you don't have access to a palliative care provider, make sure you do train yourself in basic palliative care and making sure it's an iterative process, building, finding out where the, pro the problems are to ensure that it's part, it becomes part of standardized palliative care. We cannot think that we can just adopt a Western British palliative care system in the African setting. We do need to look at what is feasible here, what can we do, how are we going to provide culturally appropriate care for these patients? And how can I, we activate our local networks, which are different from the normal hospice settings in different as, uh, areas in Africa? So my final thoughts are please start with longitudinal integration of palliative care. Start early. And as Bart Simpson says, it's never too early to refer to palliative care. Um, and thank you very much. I really would encourage you if you want to assist me to connect you with any palliative care resources in your settings, we can work with the African Palliative Care Association. There is a wide palliative care network in Africa and we can assist you to connect with palliative care resources in your setting. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Renee. Um, so I think what we'll do is we'll we'll take questions um, 
um, at the end. Um, so I think we'll move on to um, uh, Onasai Chiyaka from, um, from Harare in Zimbabwe. Um, uh, Onasai, if you can start sharing your screen. Um, um, Mark, sorry, uh, Etia, I, I think Renee has to leave, if I'm not mistaken, at five o'clock. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, so I, I wonder if okay. there are any questions. Great. Okay. Um, so if there are any questions for Renee, if, any, if you want to raise your hand um, or, or if anyone has anything to ask, um, on the side, you can start sharing your screen in the meantime, maybe. Um, if, if I can just make a common mark, I mean, you know, we, 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 of, we often miss in, in the patients that we treat on exactly how, how, how many, what proportion of our patients eventually will require um, palliative treatment, um, either primarily because of very advanced disease or uh, second, sort of secondary when, when uh, curative intent um, treatment failed. And I think as, as with pancreatic cancer in, in HCC, that group is with, where, where we intended cure, but didn't manage to, to, to achieve it, um, is also quite big. So in the end, I think, unfortunately, about 80, 90% of patients um, eventually will uh, um, need palliative care. So just that number um, sort of indicates what, what the need of palliative care is. And I remember I, I spoke a bit about this about five years ago and read up on it. And at that stage, I think only about 15 countries in Africa had had, um, had, had access to oral morphine. And that the, the estimate, if I remember correctly, it was published in Lancet, they said that 88% of patients that die of cancer in sub-Saharan Africa died with moderate or severe pain. And that gives you an indication of what, what the need is. I don't know where we are in terms of that now, um, Renee. So we've just done a national audit on morphine, um, morphine use in South Africa. And the Western Cape is very far from reaching any universal, um, any um, standard that we want to be at, but at least um, there is some oral morphine. Um, but in some provinces in the South Africa, there is very little morphine prescribed. Um, we're talking very, very little. Um, morphine prescription is an indicator of the, the level of palliative care that is de delivered. And actually, I have a slide. I wanted to include it on where morphine is prescribed in Africa and the problems of prescribing morphine in Africa. In many countries in Africa, only oncologists can prescribe palli um, morphine. Only they ha it has to go, it, or it's only available in the big hospitals. So that is a huge dilemma that we are facing. Um, however, some countries like Uganda have done remarkable work in ensuring access to morphine at primary care setting. And um, using nurse prescribers to actually deliver that palliative, uh, that morphine prescriptions and ensuring patients have access to morphine at primary care setting. I think what I've learned, um, you know, having morphine in the cupboard doesn't mean the patient's going to get the morphine. And especially when we are looking at the cultural misconceptions and how you introduce the morphine, et cetera, it is a conversation. You need to have these complex conversations with the patients and the families when prescribing morphine and making sure you don't go in too high, you start low, you go slow when you are prescribing morphine and making sure the patient can then access the morphine when they are, um, again, when the bottle is finished. And I think it's especially important when we are sending patients across Africa, when we are discharging patients and we know they're going back to Zimbabwe, we know they're going back to Malawi or they're going back to a different town to making sure that patient then will have access or a connection in that town where they can access that morphine. So yes, it's a huge, and you know, if you don't use it, they will not say we need to use it. So. I really encourage the, the leaders in um, gastro care here to really push for the access of immediate release morphine. Thanks very much. Um, I think um, I don't see any other questions. 
Um, I think we'll move on to honest size talk. Thanks very much, Rumi. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mark, and thank you uh, for the gastro for inviting me to give you a, a, a talk on uh, management of uh, palliative care in HCC. When I was looking at this topic, I noticed that um, my talk was going to be just one slide long because there's not much that we 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 have been doing for our patients with um, with HCC. So what I decided to do was just to give you a sort of a rundown of what our experience is overall in, in terms of managing HCC. And one of the last few slides, I'll talk about our setup in terms of uh, palliative care. Um, this was going to be best done by our palliative care um, uh, our physicians. Um, but I'll just run through what we what we what our experience has been um, in Zimbabwe. So um, our population as of the last census is estimated at about 14 million uh, people and liver cancer has been quite one of the leading causes of cancer uh, in, in, in the black um, males is the fifth leading cause of cancer in black males and the seventh in, in females. And uh, with statistics from 2020, there was a recorded uh, number of 678 cases um, of HCC with uh, 648 that's, so it actually remains quite a lethal uh, uh, disease um, in, 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 in our setting. We know that the majority of HCC occurs in the background of uh, uh, cirrhosis, but our, our, our observations, we don't have uh, accurate statistics yet, but our anecdotal observation is that we are actually seeing also quite a, a proportion of HCC that comes in non um, cirrhotic um, uh, patients. Yeah, just this slide just shows uh, the distribution of the different malignancies that you can see. Um, and um, being the overall about the sixth or uh, fifth cause of uh, death in males, but in terms of mortality, it is, uh, it is ranked number three, actually. Uh, so it, quite, it remains quite a, a lethal disease that we have. Uh, so that's just um, showing some of the malignancies and the distribution that we have. Out of the 16,000 recorded cases of, of cancer in 2020, uh, 678, like I said earlier on, is from, um, um, is actually HCC. Right, um, so HCC in our, in our patients tend to present very late, just like in other um, uh, developing countries. And um, there are many reasons that this has been happening. We know we, at least in our setting, we don't have any formal screening or surveillance programs um, uh, to pick up these diseases when they're still subclinical and probably in a curable, uh, curable stage. And one of the big uh, limitations also is, is access to healthcare, uh, particularly in remote uh, rural areas. Um, the setup here is that, um, most of our patients, if not all, uh, have to foot their own uh, medical bills, except for those that are under the age of five and over the age of 65. The majority have to have out of pocket uh, funding for their own medical uh, care, and that really puts a strain on access to medical care. We also have, I think this is quite common across the continent. We've got competitors in, in, all, in offering medical treatment, uh, in, in, in offering treatment to patients. We've got competition from faith healers, traditional healers and such uh, uh, kind of um, uh, service providers. So curative intended treatments are really not uh, very common with us. Uh, most patients by the time they present to us, are only going to be put on a palliative uh, care treatment plan. Um, these are some of the cases that have been, that we have um, sort of managed. You know, they come in with this extensive disease where by the time they come to us with very poor performance status and um, yeah, decompensated uh, liver uh, failure. Um, but like I said, also we have seen quite a few uh, patients that come in with large HCCs in the background of a normal uh, liver parenchyma. And in these patients, uh, the hepatitis screen has been negative. We have seen quite a few fibrolamella variances in this kind of setting. 
uh, but also the classic uh, HCCs, uh, we we seeing quite a few, and we feel sometimes that this is actually from aflatoxin exposure. So to us, this gives us an opportunity maybe to give um, to to have some uh, possible curative resection in some of these you know late presenting uh, large HCCs that come our way. Um, then in terms of managing HCCs in general, until recently there hasn't been any other treatment options for HCC management, save for just the uh, palliative care and best supportive care and end of life care, because as the, the patients came in late and there were no options anyway outside that. Uh, but in the last few years, we've started to establish some surgical and interventional uh, radiology interventional options. Uh, but during the process of trying to set this, this thing up, this uh, COVID thing came into the picture and it sort of took priority away from the efforts to try and set up some reasonable service towards, um, uh, towards uh, HCC management. And so most of these um, options that we are trying to set up, unfortunately at the moment, um, are available only in the private sector. So we are able now to do some liver resections. Um, a liver transplant, I think it's still quite a long pipe dream. One day I'm sure we'll get to that, but certainly not yet available. We are lucky to have one of our colleagues, an interventional radiologist who's back in the country and is offering some uh, interventional radio-oncology uh, interventions with uh, microwave ablation and, um, and taste. Uh, in terms of chemotherapy, sorafenib is available. Unfortunately, it's a very expensive drug uh, with patients having to, to, to have out-of-pocket uh, funding for their medical services. It still remains a, priv uh, a, a privilege to a few who can afford it. Uh, yeah, but otherwise, the best supportive treatment and, and palliative care has been well established in the, in the country. And we've got a very nice setup uh, of, of palliative care and hospice, because that has been the mainstay in terms of managing. So like I'd said, in terms of resections, we, we sometimes get this kind of patient with large tumors, but with no cirrhosis, and that has given us an opportunity to be able to get uh, to resect these patients with uh, relatively good outcomes. Um, this is just an example of a 19 year old that came in with, um, with, 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 with an HCC. The microwave ablation is also available. Unfortunately, like I've already said, uh, only available in the private sector. We only have one radiologist who's back, who's offering this service. So it's still not very accessible to the majority. And he's also doing taste, um, and uh, he's been using the lapido and doxorub with doxorubicin, cisplatin, and occasionally with mitomycin in his um, uh, treatments. Um, just another example: a patient with a quite a huge HCC in the background of cirrhosis uh, from a chronic hepatitis B infection. Uh, came in with a very high uh, alpha fetoprotein and uh, had a very good response radiological and biochemical uh, to the taste. Um, and so, so these are some of the options that we, we do have. Uh, sorafenib available only to, to those who can afford it. Uh, it's not been widely used um, uh, for the few patients that actually qualify to get it. Otherwise, most of the patients when they come, they are usually beyond the, the sorafenib treatment in any case. Right. Otherwise, uh, the mainstay for our treatment for patients is really the hospice services. Um, we've been lucky to have a hospice service that has been uh, really the first, Island Hospice has been the first uh, hospice organization to be established and to provide uh, hospice and palliative care in the country. It was established way back in 1979, and over the years, it has actually branched into many the, the, the over 17 different um, regional branches uh, countrywide. And by 2004, we have had over 13 other organizations providing palliative care. This involves both hospital-based 
uh, palliative care. Once we refer patients to the palliative care unit, they normally start from the hospital and this, is, this service is extended into the community also. We've got some social workers that are best uh, across the country who offer this, uh, uh, these hospice uh, services. Uh, they do offer psychosocial support uh, to the patients themselves and uh, spiritual support to the patients and also to the caregivers because I think the burden of taking care of these patients is, affects not only the patient but also the caregivers that stay with the patient. Yeah, they also help to provide analgesia and other medical and other medical needs that these patients do have. Um, and, but the problem now they, is that they don't just work uh, in terms of uh, cancer management and certainly not only with HCC. There are other competing needs that they also take care of. Um, you know, chronic disease like HIV and other chronic illnesses that uh, need to be taken care of out, outside hospital. So the real constraint with these uh, palliative care units is the funding to be able to fund this huge burden of cancer that is, uh, that is uh, uh, with us here, including all the other needs that are, that are, are required for, um, for end of life and you know, palliative care setting treatments. Particularly also in this uh, COVID era and uh, the depressed, the general depressed economic environment that we are finding ourselves in. So yeah, so that's basically what we 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 we, we, we have. Um, and what, our, uh, what we are when we're looking into the future, this is our the, the goals that we are trying to establish. We're hoping to establish a dedicated uh, liver management team in our tertiary institution, particularly the state hospitals. And then obviously, want to, once we've got that team, we are hoping to be able to lobby hospital administration uh, really to capacitate our hospitals so that we can offer meaningful surgical intervention for these patients and also get this interventional radiology, which is a very important part of treatment for these patients, into our state hospitals and also boost our, um, our, our oncological services also including availability of, 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 of drugs. Um, uh, the palliative care, I think so far we seem to be doing very well with that. So we just need to enhance its, uh, uh, its, its efficiencies and, and, and reach to all the people that require it. Yeah, but um, this uh, business of out-of-pocket uh, um, uh, payments for cancer treatment is really not uh, feasible and we would want to lobby our government to um, to take uh, cancer treatment to make it free to, to everyone so that it can be affordable and accessible. It's no use having a service that is not uh, uh, affordable because essentially it's not available to those people who really need it. Uh, we have had so many other diseases here, the chronic diseases like HIV and TB that have been funded fully so that patients get it for free and we're hoping this also be extended to um to to cancer treatment particularly this or this hhcc which is quite a big uh, problem once we've got all this now um with once we have a, a team that is managing liver disease then we can also start pro probably start the screening and surveillance for these high risk groups to be able to pick it up earlier and 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 manage it, uh, so that we can actually improve overall survival. At the moment, the screening and surveillance would make sense if we can't quite offer any treatment to those people who have uh, been diagnosed of this. So, in a nutshell, this is just our experience uh, north of the Limpopo, and um, I thank you for the time to share our experience. Uh, th thanks very much, Anasai. Uh, that was very interesting. Um, if anyone has any questions, if they can just raise raise their hand. Um, I just Anasai. I mean, I think it's great that that you've got two of the three curative treatment options available, and it does seem like there's there's reasonable access to to palliative palliative care. You know, like I said in the beginning, if you consider the disease in Africa, I mean, the number of patients who actually are going to benefit from transplantation is, is quite small. So, you know, I think from a public health point of view, the, the benefit of offering transplantation is actually not that big. And probably 
um, you know, taste, there's going to be a lot more patients who need interventional radiology and taste as opposed to, to, um, to, to, to transplant. Um, I was just wondering also about, you know, is, do you think there's good access to morphine because it's a cheap, cheap drug? Um, and, you know, it's not something that we really talk about very much, but obviously, you know, it, it, there's a bit of a stigma with it being prescribed. And um, do you think that that is a problem in, in Zimbabwe? Um, with, with our hospice services, I think they try to make it available. Uh, it's obviously not, they can't cover everyone who needs it. And uh, unfortunately, even if it is cheap uh, relatively, uh, most of the people who really need it come from very poor backgrounds and the, even the cheapest of medication, if they have to pay for it usually, they can't afford it, particularly if it's going to be for a long duration of time. So um, yes, the hospice services tend to make it available to the lucky few, but most of everyone else, we, they need to get a prescription and get it from some pharmacies at a small price, definitely. Okay. Um, we obviously we sometimes have the limitation of not getting the, the, the rapid onset morphine. We made what I've seen that is really available is the long acting morphines most of the time. Okay. So it's not exactly available. The hospice have been trying the best they can to make it available, though. but the funding constraints obviously limits its availability to the wider population. And it's obviously only available probably closer to the big cities and uh, to the big hospitals. Outside there, it's not, it's not available. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm going to just show a case. I'm just going to share my screen uh, to see if I can show it. Um, okay, so I think um, I, I chose this case mainly because it's a patient that's in, in hospital at, at the moment. Um, and I, I do think it raises some of the issues um, uh, th that we've discussed. So it's a, it's a young patient, young male, 34 years old, um, who's married, um, self-employed. He, he lives in Cape Town in a shack, but um, he, 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 he makes clothes with his wife. Um, but now that he's unwell, he's going to be moving in with his sister who, um, who lives in a more formal house. He does not smoke or drink. Um, he has no family history of liver disease. He did have pulmonary tuberculosis three years ago, which, which has been treated. Um, and he doesn't seem to have many long lasting effects from that. He started experiencing epigastric pain about a month ago um, and then became jaundiced um, with dark urine and pale stools and pruritus. Um, he's not has not been on any medication, no comorbidities um, apart from the previous TB. He's HIV negative. On presentation, he was deeply jaundiced, um, no lymphadenopathy, no edema. Um, apart from the jaundice, no no real features of chronic liver disease. Um, his liver was tender and palpable, five centimeters below the costal margin. No ascites, no splenomegaly, no evidence of portal hypertension. So his ECOG performance status is one, his child Pew score works out as seven, and that's purely because of the jaundice. Um, the MALT score, once again, is elevated because he's jaundiced. Um, you can see the blood's there. His INR is fairly well preserved, a normal renal function. And then this bilirubin of 290 with, um, with markedly elevated canalicular enzymes. His hepatitis B core antibody was positive, surface antigen negative, um, and he had an elevated alpha feta protein um, at um, 7,200. So um, I'm just going to show you his MRI scan, um, and I'm only going to show the, the T2 weighted image because it shows the biliary, dilata sorry, uh, the biliary dilatation quite well. So I'm just you can see, um, I'm just going to slowly go through it. Um, I don't know if there's a lag, um, but you can see the central mass in, in the liver. Um, and with it being a T2 rated uh, image, the bile ducts are, are white. And you can see the, the dilated bile ducts um, and the separation of the right and left sided bile ducts. Um, 
this image did not meet all the radiological criteria for the diagnosis of an HCC, but with, with the hepatitis B exposure and alpha feta protein of 7,200, we're fairly confident that it is a HCC. Um, so he went on um, to have an ERCP and the, the ERCP um, initially we placed three plastic stents. Um, so you can see there's two stents going into the, the anterior and posterior, posterior sexual ducts on the right, and then another stent on the, on the left. Um, he, he initially um, was okay after the procedure, but then started spiking temperatures and developed cholangitis. And we thought that was probably because the left side of the liver was not well drained. So you can see on this image, we've now placed a, um, a, a metal stent uh, uncovered metal stent into the left side of the liver. And just to facilitate access, there's a covered stent uh, more, more distally. So that was done about two or three days ago. And since we've done that, his bilirubin has dropped quite markedly and his temperature is resolved. But um, he's still quite quite sick. Um, so, so currently we have a patient who has um, resolving uh, cholangitis. Um, and, our, and our plan going forward is, is to do a, um, a transarterial chemoembolization. And the, the lesion measures nine centimeters at the moment. If it decreases in size um, to below um, seven centimeters and, and the alpha feta protein drops, he will potentially become um, uh, transplantable. Um, so, so the th Obviously, a lot of things have to go right for this guy for that to happen, and and I think this is one of the problems we have. You know, when we're discussing palliative care, we've got a patient who, up until a month ago, is in his thirties, he was completely well, and now has this diag this very serious diagnosis of dealing with a, a potentially lethal disease, um, and at this stage, he needs help. You know, dealing with the psychological aspects of this, dealing with the management of the symptoms. He needs help understanding the aspects of the disease and the different treatment options available. And down the line, he may become a transplant candidate, but there's also a very real chance that, that he ends up progressing or not becoming a transplant candidate and needing um, help with end of life care. So I thought, you know, this, this illustrates for me the difficult one of some of the difficulties we have with HEC, dealing with young patients who have lots of symptoms who are difficult to manage and I think it's worthwhile getting palliative care involved early, even in patients who might be considered for pure curative care, um, because, because they, they can help with all these other aspects. So I don't know if anyone has any questions or comments. I'm going to stop sharing. Um, um, but th that's basically um, um, my, my thoughts on, on this. Um, Mark, I can just maybe um, a comment or got some questions for for Onasai. Onasai, you mentioned that that um, HCC is the the fifth or the sixth most common tumor in males and the seventh in females. Is is that correct? Yes, that's 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 correct, Prof. Um, it's the in in males it's the fifth uh, commonest. Yeah. Uh, in females, because of the other gynecological one, it drops to about number seven. Yeah. Uh, currently in the uh, black males and females. It's much less on in the other races. Because something that's always <clears throat> sort of, um, I, I found very strange is that if you look even to countries in the same region um, with sharing borders and probably many of the risk factors for, for HCCs, that you find these massive differences in when, when the when the tumors are are listed in terms of their their annual incidence and and that HCC in many of these countries and if you read any introduction to to an article on HCC it they will say it's the first or the second uh, most common in or third uh, in in many countries in Africa or in sub-saharan Africa but then you get these massive variations in 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 the incidence as it's reported for the different countries so in South Africa, it's a 25. Um, and, and the reason for that is that the, 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 the statistics are based on patients where there is histological confirmation of the disease. And it's only from one of the 
from one of the laboratories in South Africa, the state, the state sort of owned laboratory and not any of the private laboratories that also do a significant amount of work. And if you look at how they, how this is estimated between the countries, you see if there's no statistics from, from, a, from a specific country, they will sort of try to guess by looking at what's going on around the country and then come up with numbers of that country. But, but I think what, you know, we, we, Renee spoke about the stigma as well. The stigma of liver cancer is people that do drugs and they drink a lot. Um, chronic pancreatitis have got the same problem and pancreatic cancer the same. So there's really a perception that these are patients that, that have, have got a disease that infected on themselves. I think it's pretty true, true for, um, for many of the etiologies, I mean, alcohol being one and maybe the metabolic syndrome uh, being another, but certainly in, in Africa, where most of the patients um, get their virus at birth, it's certainly not something that's got to do with any, any behavior. And I, and I think these, these addressing, we, we spoke about palliative care and that other patients are, are prioritized as well when it comes to that, is that there's really an, an advocacy that has to happen for patients with HCC. And, and under-reporting the, the actual extent of the problem doesn't help the cause. And then just a second point I wanted to make is, is serafinib has almost become a household name in, in, in the, the palliative treatment of, um, of, of HCC. And we know what that advantage of that, if you look at the initial study that was published, is two months of, of gained life at an incredible cost and with very sort of debilitating um, side, side effect. But I think there are other options and, and uh, I'm not, I haven't got any shares in anything, but I, I had spoken to the people for uh, marketing Lynn Batten um, recently. And if, if what they say is going to happen, they, they are probably gonna come into the market at uh, at, the, at the price where, where we, even in the state in South Africa, maybe we'll have access um, to that, but it, we're still not there. Thanks, Ed. Uh, I see Bilal Bobat, who's a hepatologist at uh, Donald Gordon in Joburg, um, has, has his hand raised. Bilal. Hi, Mark. Um, thanks Hi. so much for this topic. Uh, I, I'd actually raise my, my hand to make the same point that uh, Ed just made. I often offer patients serafinib, warn them about the side effects. It takes a long time, even in the private sector, for medical aid to approve um, its use. And by then, you know, often the disease has, has run further into its course. Um, and when the patient actually gets the drug, they can barely tolerate it. So I, I, just, I just want to ditto um, uh, Prof. Jonas's point. I think, I think aside from lembatinib, other very promising agents include etazolizumab uh, and bevacizumab. Um, which did actually show a significant survival benefit for, for these sort of patients. Um, but that I think is still, is still some time to come and I think even longer to filter out into, uh, the, 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 uh, into the public sector and, 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 other, and other places um, that certainly, as you, as you pointed out, needs them. I think just one other matter that I'd like to raise in terms of palliation of patients with uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, and especially those with advanced cirrhosis or portal vein involvement, is the presence of other manifestations of liver failure and what, what to do with those manifestations. For instance, your hepatic encephalopathy, would you continue the rifaximin and lactulose, knowing that the lactulose can add to uh, epigastric discomfort and pain, and the encephalopathy may very well, with the endogenous opiate production, even uh, temper the pain that they're experiencing from from the cancer. And this, uh, this, these are sort of you know some of the discussions that we have with our palliative care team um, here in Johannesburg when 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 we're dealing with uh, these sort of matters. The other thing that I find challenging with these patients is especially when there's portal vein involvement um, is refractory ascites. Um, and that, that can be very difficult to, to control. Um, you're trying to emphasize your low salt diet, trying to at the same time maintain a caloric intake uh, with the patient. 
<clears throat> and I think that there comes a point where you as the treating physician needs need to draw a line in terms of what am I trying to buttress here in terms of the development of ascites, development of encephalopathy versus the progression of the HCC and the comfort of the patient. Um, and especially when you're talking about utilization of opiates, which will precipitate encephalopathy. Um, I, think, I think we mustn't be afraid to utilize um, the, those sort of drugs. Uh, thanks, Bilal. Um, Ghassan Abu Alpha um, uh, has his hand raised. Yeah, thanks so much, Mark. Uh, again, thanks. I'm, I'm beyond delighted that I'm able to join on your meeting. And I'm really touched by all the uh, kind of comments that were given. And I 100% agree on what was stated in regard to the challenge in regard to sorafenib or even to other systemic therapies. And if anything, I'm just trying to uh, kind of like uh, raise a shout here to what Ed and many others of you already are involved in, but I'll share my screen for a quick second. And this is what probably we're gonna do with all of you. Uh, we have a built up the Africa Liver Cancer Guidelines uh, meeting that will happen October 19 and 20. Uh, this will be virtual. And uh, if anything, it's really rather than all of us in Africa depend on what other right guidelines for and copy. Let's write our own guidelines to kind of like see what's available, accessible, applicable. Uh, so proudly, many of you are already involved, involved. We have about 35 countries in Africa involved in this program. And uh, by all means, we look forward to see you all. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'll send in the chat uh, the link for registration. This is totally free uh, and uh, we love to see you all. It will be about three and a half hours for two days back to back at a reasonable time in Africa. But I think this will be an opportunity to bring in question about lymphatinib access at Izubev, et cetera, because this sponsorship, this is independent of drug companies, not involved at all, but nonetheless the sponsorship is coming from them because they do understand the challenges that the continent has in that regard. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Kassan. Um I don't see any other hands uh, raised and we sort of coming up to the full hour. So I'd just like to thank uh, everyone who's been involved and thanks to ECHO uh, University of uh, New Mexico and the ECHO India team for, for running the, the meeting. Um, and um, there will be feedback forms available um, in the chat. Um, and, and recordings of this uh, will, will be available on the Gastro Foundation website. So thanks again to the presenters and also to the sponsors, Takedo, Akino, Amogen, Equity and Aspen and Adcock Ingram. So thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for, for joining the meeting. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, thanks Mark.